Good morning, good morning. Come on, anybody excited to be in the house this morning? Y'all ready to worship? Oh, come on, clap your hands in the room. Come on, come on. Hey! Everybody clap those hands. Are we coming to give a praise this morning? Hey! Here we go. Sing it out. Sing hey.
an amazing day. It's a beautiful day in the great state of Mississippi. And we're so glad that you decided to join us here at Vibrant Church. And if this is your first time with us, or maybe it's been a while since you've been here, you are what we call a VIP, a very important person to us. So we'd like to celebrate you all across this room. Can we celebrate everybody in this room and online today? It's great to see you. And just by being here, yep. they're making a difference. They're making a difference. So you'll see on the seat back in front of you, there's a QR code that you can either scan or fill out that card and turn into the VIP area where we have a special gift for you. By doing that, we are able to donate money to the Mississippi Food Network. And because of people such as yourself, we have been able to donate 72,019 wow. meals. So thank you for making a difference in Mississippi. Yes, and we would, we would love for you to come at least times? three times, three times. Yes. Don't miss out on that. Yes. And we have some amazing things coming up this summer for our students. Come on. So if you're in student group, we have Youth Summit coming up. Um, sixth grade to senior in high school. That's right. And um, that, well, that's a good time for you as a student just to kind of unplug and experience the presence of God. That's right. And registration start, well, it's already started. It's but already started, yeah. You can sign up today in the lobby or you can do it online. 
Yeah, yeah, don't miss out on that. It's a great opportunity for your students and honestly a great opportunity for the parents to just kick them out the door. Yep. Get them out the door for a few days. It'll be really good. And then where are our men at? Are there some men in the room? Maybe there's a few, some guys like, me, me? One guy was like, me? No, yeah, yes, you, yes, you. If you are a man, we want to invite you to Man Night, May 1st at 7 p.m. We're going to have great food, great time of fellowship, that iron sharpens iron. There's something about men, you know, you hear Pastor Ethan talk about it a lot. It's encouraging we see men leading their families, men taking charge, men doing what God's called them to do, leading spiritually. There's something amazing about that. So come May 1st at 7 p.m. Don't miss out on that opportunity. Yes, and church, we believe in being a generous church here at Vibrant. Um, yes. We have um, several ways to give that you will see, but one of the ways that we get to bless our community through your giving is we get to bless Life Choices Pregnancy Center. Yes. They help women in crisis and with unplanned pregnancies, with counseling and resources, right. and they do an amazing yes. job in our community. They do. So thank you for being a part of that. You're making a difference. Can we stand to our feet as we enter back into worship today? Aren't you thankful that he is great and worthy to be praised? That's the God we serve, amen. Father, we thank you for today. You are great and worthy to be praised. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us, Father. It, it doesn't change who you are. Father, we worship you today. We give you glory that is due your name. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's worship today. And 
makes no sense. You're the God of the middle. You're the God of the middle. And in the middle of my failure, you're the grace that won't relent. Oh, come on, come on. And in the middle of my suffering, you're the strength I need to stand. Hey. In the middle of the chaos, you're the peace that makes no sense. Hey. Cause you're the God of the middle You're the God of the middle And in the middle of the garden Your will is signed for His For the joy set before you You were drawn to the end And in the middle of the cross You bore the way of sin And in the middle of that tomb It was death that made Sometimes I think it's easy for us to look back when we get to the end of a struggle and we thank God that he was there at the end and we know he was with us at the beginning but Jesus said I'll never leave you nor forsake you so I've come to tell you today I don't know what you're in the middle of but our God is able to find you in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your pain, in the middle of a courtroom, in the middle of struggle and difficulty and setbacks. Why? Because He is the God of the... Come on, give God praise all over this house. God of the middle, right? In the middle of a funeral home a few weeks ago, Miss Debbie, and you two had to navigate things, but guess who was there the whole time? Never left us nor forsook us. When your father passed away, Pastor Tyson, he was God in the middle. When you two were trying to get pregnant, trying to navigate life and trying to figure out what's going on, God was right in the middle with your dad in Jackson with whatever he has, that's, what, what is that again? What is it? 
GBS. As he, he went to a, a, a new center, right? He's coming home Friday. How long was he in for? Nine months in the hospital. Can I tell you, God was right in the middle. Right in the middle. You know, so many of you have been asking about this song and people have been texting in and saying, where can I find this song? When can we, I, I can't find it. Can I tell you something? That's a song our team wrote. And, and I got good news for you. Uh, there are more songs to come. This is just the beginning of what we feel God's doing in our church. And this song releases on May the 5th on Spotify and Apple Music, the first of many. The reason we wanted to do this is because we believe God's doing something in our church. And I believe what God is doing here is, is resonating with people in our community. And we want to reach out further and reach as many people as we can. So we thought one of the ways to do so was with the music. And how many of you are already enjoying this song? Enjoy our worship team. Thank you, guys. Incredible job. We got, come up here, Pastor. Let's just, you pick the shirts that fit you the best, clearly. <laughs> This is some of the merch that we have here. Let everybody see the back. So this is God of the Middle stuff, and you are soaking wet. <laughs> Listen, this, the, we have a bunch of these shirts, uh, and I want to encourage you. It's just our Vibrant Worship uh, shirts for sale in the uh, Resource Center. I want to encourage you to grab some uh, on your way out today because we want to support what God is doing here. And I believe that the best is yet to come. Are you with me? Before you're seated, before you're seated, I want to do something. Um, as you know, many of you know, if we watch the news, as Christians, um, it is, I believe, our responsibility to keep our eye on what God is doing in Israel. Uh, we are required, the Bible teaches us in Psalms 122 that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so as of last night, I or right past time of last night, I ran, made some moves, and, and that's a big deal. In fact, if you've been watching the news, things could escalate very quickly. And talking to some people last night, they think this is the most unstable the Middle East has been in our lifetime. What happened in the last 24 hours? Not to scare anybody, but I want you to know something. We're supposed to pray, and we need to be ready. And I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I feel like I could get up every week and say this. I just know this, he is coming back. There's no need to be afraid as the church. Just be ready, be ready, just be ready. But I think we need to take a moment as a church, if you're joining us online, be a part of this as well. Let's pray for the Middle East as a whole. And let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Can we do that? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. There are many nations and families and women and children, and there's a lot of moving pieces. And Father, we ask that your hand be upon the nation of Israel. We pray that you protect them and you do what your plan is. We just trust you. And Father, we pray for the people of Iran. We pray for the people of, of all over that area. Father, we just pray your hand be involved. We pray that your spirit show up. And we pray that millions of people in that part of the nation will begin to call on the name of Jesus Christ. We believe it today in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Give God a big praise. Well, before you're seated, why don't you greet two or three people around you? Let them know it's good to see them in the house of God today.
morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being a part of the service today. The weather is beautiful. It's like a perfect weekend, so I'm not going to preach long. I'm going to get you out of here. You know I'm lying. All right. Today we're going to continue that thought that we launched on Easter uh, the idea of God of the middle. And then last week, as you know, we had our baptisms. I don't even remember the final count of our baptism, but wasn't that amazing hearing their stories and life change? That's what it's all about. We still have more to come, and we'll let you know more about that. But as we are continuing in this idea of God of the middle, I wanna take you to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20, beginning in verse 19, this is what the Bible says. It says, the disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Now, let me just pause and explain where we're at. Jesus has been crucified, and now it is during that time frame of them, they have not seen Jesus yet since his resurrection. And so this is what happens, verse 19. The disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And on the evening of that same Sunday, which is referring to the Sunday that Jesus rose from the dead, they locked themselves in a room. Suddenly, somebody say suddenly, Jesus appeared in the middle. Somebody say in the middle. Jesus appeared in the middle of the group. He greeted them and showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they became very happy, and Jesus said again, peace be with you. It was the Father who sent me, and I am now sending you in the same way. You jump down to verse 26. A week later, the disciples were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came in while the doors were still locked and stood in the middle of the group, He greeted his disciples, verse 27, and said to Thomas, Thomas had missed out the first time, and he looks at Thomas and says, put your finger here, look at my hands, put your hands into my side, stop doubting, and have faith. Someone say God of the middle. My pastor recently shared with me a story that I want to share with you about a lady from Georgia. Her name is Autumn Lynn. She guarantees that she can teach your children how to swim in just three days or your money back. And so you have to book months in advance. It's hard to get in, long waiting list. And she says to this day that she has never returned anybody's money. When a kid shows up on the first day, the first thing she does is take the child and throws them. Somebody's like, what's her name? Let me get her number real quick. (laughs) Throws them in the deep end. She calls the first lesson, find the wall. And it's not uncommon to hear kids screaming (laughs) <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny. I don't know why you're laughing. Kids, kids crying. In fact, kids oftentimes beg not to go back. And they say that the dads oftentimes bring the kids the second time because the mothers are like traumatized by what they saw happen to their kid. By day three, the kids are jumping off of diving boards, laughing, having fun, and swimming. And Autumn's approach is simply this. Face your fears. Find the wall. Find the place of limitation and face your fears. In the story that we just read, that's what we're looking at. We find ourselves where these 11 apostles, Judas is dead, Jesus in their mind has, is still dead, 
And so these 11 disciples are now in fear that they are gonna be next on the list of the Jewish leaders who crucified Jesus. So the scripture lets us know that they're hiding after three plus years, Jesus' popularity has hit an all-time high. They had falsely accused him, he's crucified, and now they're uncertain about their future. There's a lot of confusion. And here's what we understand, is that there's no doubt all kinds of emotions going on behind closed doors. All kinds of confusion behind closed doors. Let me read that verse again, verse 19. The disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders, and on the evening of that same Sunday, they locked themselves in a room. I want you to imagine with me for a few moments, Jesus is, has commissioned these men and is going to commission these men in just a few verses that they are to go out. They are to, they are to, be, to be the leaders of the newfound church. He tells Peter that he's gonna use him to launch the church. And all of these big leaders who we now revere, who wrote letters in the New Testament, who did great things for God, all of which except for John were martyred for the name of Jesus Christ. They're all hidden behind closed doors. And not only have they gone in there, the Bible says that they had, they had locked it. So not only have they, there are they, running, not only are they confused, but they've, they've closed the door and they've, they've locked it. I think if you and I were honest today, there are some emotions that you and I could be feeling that they could relate to behind closed doors that day that you and I can find ourselves locking the door, closing it up, and feeling all these emotions. Because life has a way of making us want to shut the door. Come on, say amen, somebody. Make us want to shut the door. Make us want to lock it. Don't know where to go. Don't know where to turn. Circumstances seem to do that. And that's what we find in the story. I believe, if you just give me a few minutes, I want to just take you down through some of the things that I believe uh, they were feeling in the room that day. The first emotion the scripture lets us know was fear. Everybody say fear. Fear. The 11 disciples had, had, had witnessed their leader receive capital punishment, so they thought they were next. I want you to think about this. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thaddeus, Bartholomew, Matthew, all of them in hiding, feeling total fear. Fear has a way of imprisoning us. It's like the, the story of the little boy that went to his mother and said, Mom, can I... Sleep in your bed tonight. She goes, why? He goes, because I'm afraid of the dark. He says, so can I sleep in your bed? She goes, little Johnny, your daddy's sleeping in bed with me tonight. He looks at his mom and says, he's such a big sissy. (laughs) Here's the reality that it's not just little Johnny that's scared. Can I get a big amen? Amen that we have a lot of fear, if we were honest today, that makes us get behind closed doors, that makes us lock it up and say, you know what, some of us are afraid of our past. Some of us are afraid of the future. Even some of you are afraid of the present situations that you are facing. But many of us, if we're not careful, will find ourselves pushing back, closing the door, barricading the door, just barring everything out and say, you know what, I don't know what's going on, but I know I'm safe in here. We have this flight or fight mentality, and honestly, sometimes when we find ourselves in that place, it's easy to feel hopeless. It's easy to feel feel a sense of loss. We see that they have fear. I think the next thing they have is, is disappointment. The disciples, we know of two of them. One is called Simon the Zealot, and the other one is, is Thaddeus. They were both zealots. In other words, they, were, they had bitter opposition toward the government. Somebody's like, hmm, okay, I'm one of those. The overall consensus among the disciples, and especially these guys who would, I believe, 
jumped on the band the bandwagon to follow Jesus because they believed, and among many, believed Jesus was going to overthrow the oppressive government of Rome. And so these men, along with many others, in fact, the scripture says they sought to make Jesus king. They wanted to make Jesus king. The Bible says he had nothing to do with it. In fact, what he says later to Pilate is that my kingdom is not of this world. So what you're trying to make me do, I'm not here for. I'm not here to be the king of Israel. I'm here to be the king of the world. I'm much bigger than you think. And so no doubt, the disciples were assuming that at any given moment, Jesus was about to step up and he was about to show off. He was about to take Pilate and Herod and Caesar out. He was about to set up the rule because the belief was that's what the Messiah was going to do. But little did they understand the Messiah didn't just come for that to show up and to, to, to do miracles and healings. Jesus didn't come to overthrow the government. Jesus came to overthrow our selfishness and sin and shame. That's why Jesus came. But no doubt they were struggling with their unmet expectations. He had done all these miracles for what? He had done all these healings. He raised the dead. For what? Have you ever been there when you felt like God disappointed you? And you find yourself locking up, shutting the door. I think another thing that we're feeling was maybe mistrust and slash betrayal. You got to think their friend Judas and their leader Jesus has died within the last few days. The close-knit group had experienced a shattering thing. Two people in their group, especially their leader, is dead. And no doubt, the rumors going through the room that Judas did this. The blaming, the allegations, the second guessing, who else could be lying? How did this happen? Why did he do this? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been hurt? Has hurt and betrayal and mistrust caused you and I in relationships to back up and just close the door and say, you know what, if that's how church people are, I don't want nothing to do with it. If that's how people are gonna be, I don't want nothing to do with it. So we just push the door, close it, and we lock it, throw away the key. Can I tell you today you're not alone? Because that's what they were feeling. I believe the next thing they were experiencing was abandonment. Jesus who was with them, who always knew what to say, who always knew what to do, was not there to help them. Jesus, if there's ever been a time where we need you, we need you when we're locked up and the door shut and we feel fear and it feels like he's absent. I'm trying to help somebody today that that maybe you feel like you're in a hospital room and you're praying for your family member and it just seems like when you need him the most, he's absent. Have you ever been there when you're trying to hold your kid's hand through surgery and you're just wondering, God, where are you? And he feels absent. You're going through cycles of, of, of counseling with your marriage and over and over, you've tried to make it work and, and seasons is good and other seasons is bad and what's happening is it just feels like, God, I have prayed. I have been sincere. And it feels like you're experiencing abandonment. I think maybe... The last thing that I believe they're experiencing is is unbelief. Unbelief. The Bible lets us know that Thomas, in the room the second time, had a hard time with this. He said, unless he just shows up, I see the holes in his hands myself. And people can blame Thomas, but the reality of it is, he just saw the guy brutally murdered. So we can put... Thomas down and say, oh, brother doubting Thomas. Praise God, if I was in that room that night, I knew he said he'd be back in three days. I doubt it. Because if you saw what they saw, 
It'd be hard to believe that he's going to come back from the dead. Are you with me? It'd be hard to believe. When you've seen so much, it's hard to have faith. Can I be honest with you? I'm going to be real just for a second. I didn't plan on saying this. But I have felt like even in my own spirit, in the last 12 months, I'm being too vulnerable. I shouldn't even say this. I feel like the devil can get in my head when I'm trying to pray for someone else to get a miracle. It's like something comes into my head and says, but this person didn't get a miracle and you prayed then. And so because I've seen some things not come to pass the way I expected, it affects the faith I have for somebody else who is expecting right now. And, and the enemy can get in our head based on what we've been through and say, you know what, there's no way he can do it because he didn't do it then. And can I just tell you this? I can't explain why things don't happen, but at the end of the day, you and I have to trust God in the middle of situations and say, you know what? If everybody died of cancer tomorrow, our God is still a healer. At some point, you're gonna have to choose who God is based on what you know rather than what you have experienced. I gotta add that in for next service. But, but, but stay with me, they're experiencing unbelief. They're, they're struggling with what they're seeing. Thomas is doubting. Thomas is saying, how can God show up when it looks like this? Have you ever thought that? I mean, for the people who pray for your son, oh, we're gonna pray for your son, honey. I know he's far from God. It's so easy for them to say that. But when you were in the room, and he comes home drunk, and things are getting slammed on the counter, and he's cussing you out, and things are crazy, it's hard to have faith. For everybody else can look in, they're encouraging you, and they're good, and I thank God for people in small groups and church family who wanna believe with you that God can help you through storms, but have you ever been there where you're like, it's gonna have to be God? It's gonna have to be God because this is too, and that's what Thomas was dealing with, this unbelief. He wasn't demonic, he wasn't mad, he's just like, are you kidding? The first time, the Bible says Thomas missed it. And everybody comes to Thomas like, you won't believe it. Thomas is like, you guys have PTSD something. You're, you're, I don't know what you think you're seeing. The Bible says seven days later, eight days later, God shows up in the room and says, hey to everybody, and then turns to Thomas. I was like, yo. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't forget about the Thomases in the room? He can find Thomases that feel left out when you feel like everybody else is getting it and you're just over here trying to figure it out. Here's the situation. When we lock ourselves in, we also lock things out. When you and I put ourselves in this room because of the emotions we're experiencing, we, as a result, to protect ourselves from harm, also keep ourselves away from help. When you and I make up in our mind that this is where we're gonna live, we then, as a result, protect ourselves from the solutions of the problems that we're facing. Are you with me? So for example, if you and I get hurt in relationships and we experience betrayal or gossip or pain and we go in this door, come on, how many of you know people are crazy? Family's crazy, things happen, offense takes place. You and I go in and we close the door behind us like, ain't no way, ain't coming out. She's crazy, she said this, he said that, and as a result, we become hardened toward people, and the scripture teaches us that God's mechanism for healing people is people. So even though people may have hurt you, God uses people to heal you. And when you and I become like, I'm never gonna get, I'm never gonna marry again, all women are crazy. Well, don't be too hateful, God's got a woman on the way. And we lock ourselves in, and God's saying, when you lock yourself in, you're locking out what I have for you to heal you. 
I think the same can be true of church hurt. We get mad in the church and somebody makes us mad and, and, and something happens, because I've said this before, I say this a lot around here because I'm trying to keep a religious spirit out of our church. Hey, I take a louder amen than that. This must be the religious service. <laughs> I'm trying to keep a religious, hateful spirit out of our church, and the way to do that is keep reminding our church we're human beings. We're people who are imperfect following a perfect God. I also say that to kind of build your muscle up because at some point, something in this church is going to offend you and at some point, you are gonna be tempted if you have not already in the past locked yourself in a room and said, I hate the church, I'm church hurt, I'm angry, I can't believe they did that, I can't believe they said that, and hear me today, the number one way to get over church hurt is to be church healed. But when you and I lock ourselves out of the church, and we lock ourselves in, we keep the church out, and the way God wants to heal us could be through the local body that you and I have pushed away. Am I helping you today? Because watch this, the longer you're away and the more you insist on being out, the deeper the bitterness goes and the more callous you become. And I wanna encourage you that if you're watching online or you're in the room and you're just poking your head in today and you're like, listen, I've done church, I've tried this. Listen, get in, get involved, get engaged and let the church that God had designed for the earth is not for just like perfect people. It's for all of us. And God's design is to use the church to help us. Can I get a witness? So we use, we'll get, try to protect ourselves from sadness. And as a result, we protect ourselves or keep our, keep our joy away. We try to keep our pain away. And as a result, we keep the pleasure away. And watch what happens, John chapter 20, verse 19. The disciples were afraid of the Jewish leaders on the evening, on the same day. They locked themselves in a room, and suddenly, I love that. Suddenly, Jesus appeared in the middle of the group. Jesus came to the middle. Jesus was fully aware of the doubt that Thomas had. Jesus was fully aware of what the zealots in the room were struggling with. Jesus was fully aware of the betrayal they were all sensing and the abandonment they were going through. Jesus was fully aware of the fear they were experiencing. And despite what they were feeling, Jesus stepped right into the middle of the situation. Why? Because God knows how to get behind closed doors. Are you with me? It doesn't matter how thick the walls are. It doesn't matter how strong the door is. It doesn't matter how strong the locks may be. When God decides to step beyond the situation that you have barred yourself in, he can find you right where you are. God knows how to find you in rooms. Think of Peter's Think of Peter's mother-in-law who was sick in the house and Jesus came into the room and the situation completely changed when Jesus stepped into the middle of the room. Think of Jairus' daughter who was sick and dying and dead in fact and Jesus, the Bible says, came into the room and he healed her and he raised her from the dead because Jesus stepped in the room, when Jesus steps behind closed doors. Can I tell you today, I know there are some people praying and believing and trusting God in this season for your son, for your daughter, for your marriage. I don't know what has been barricaded in your life, but can I tell you, God knows how to find you right where you are. God knows how to see your marriage. God knows how to find your son and daughter. God knows how to show up in difficult situations because like I said, it doesn't matter how deep the offense is. It doesn't matter how strong the lock is is when Jesus wants to find you, he'll walk right through the wall and find you. Look at this, John chapter 20, in my closing remarks, I wanna say this. John chapter 20, verse 20 through 21. He greeted them 
and showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, watch this, they became very happy. They became very happy when they saw him. Watch what happens next, verse 21. Then Jesus said again, peace be with you. They were settled because Jesus did two things. Two things Jesus did. He, number one, he showed them who he was. Look at my hands. Look at my side. God reveals to them who he is. When you're in the middle of circumstances, have you ever been there when God revealed who he was in the middle of hard times? In the middle of divorce, God seemed to show you who he was. We think that God reveals who he is when he takes us out of situations, which is good. But there are times when you're still in the situation and God just shows up in it and says, look, I'm right here. I'm with you in the middle of the battle. I'm with you in the middle of deep waters. I'm with you in the middle of struggle. I'm with you in the middle of mental battles. I am right here. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you my strength when you're weak. Let me show you my joy when you're sad. Let me show you my power. Let me show you my strength. He showed up right in the middle and he showed them who he was. And the next thing he, the Bible says he did is that he said what they needed to hear. So, so not only did he show himself who, showed them who he was, he said what they needed to hear. He said, peace. I know you feel abandonment. Peace. I, I know you're feeling fear. Peace. I know you're feeling anxiety. Peace. I, I know you're struggling right now, but I've stepped into the middle of where you are to say, shh, peace. I can show up right in the middle. There are people, when you come to church, you'll see people crying sometimes. Can I tell you, it's just not how good the worship songs are. Sometimes, while they're worshiping, it's like God is showing them who he is. And you see those tears flowing. And it's easy to judge people. Oh, that must be a wreck. What's wrong with them? Maybe God just whispered something and said, peace. Maybe in the middle of a sermon, you've been listening and you've been in a hard place, in a hard time, and a word comes out, a sentence comes out, a scripture comes out, and it's like God just settles you. Peace. Can I tell you today, that's my prayer for you, is that whatever storm you may be facing, whatever room you've locked yourself in, whatever wall that you have found, Whatever place you've, you've locked up and barred and shut, that God can show up right there and show you who he is and say, peace. I know you're traumatized from being molested as a child, but peace. I know you're struggling with what happened to you, but peace. I know you're offended. I know things happened. I know things took place, but peace. Have you ever been there? That in the lowest points of life, God showed up in the middle, showed you who he was, and gave you peace that passes understanding. Thomas, peace. Bartholomew, peace. Imagine the relief they experienced the moment they saw him. The Bible says they were happy. He's alive. Can I tell you, God can bring life right to the place where it feels like death reigns. With eyes closed all over the room and no one looking around, I want to ask you the question. Do you feel like you've locked yourself up? 
Do you feel like you've just shut the door? Do you feel like you've, you've turned the key? Does it feel like to you that you've just pushed everybody out? Does it feel like you have found yourself in hard situations where you have said, you know what, I don't want nothing to do with this God? If you were honest today, and you would be honest in the presence of God and say, you know what, here's where I'm at. I'm struggling because I've locked myself up. I've been abused one too many times and I locked myself up. I've been lied to enough, so I locked myself up. I've been mistreated. I've been abandoned. I've been uh, locked myself up. If you were honest today, do me a favor and just slip a hand up. I'm not going to come back and embarrass you. Come on, hands just going up all over the room. So that's me. I feel like I've been here. I've, this is my struggle right now. Thank you. You can put them down. Thank you. You stand with me all over the room. I just want to pray with you. Is that okay? That wherever you are, right in the middle, that you and I do not have to feel fear. We don't have to feel abandoned. We cannot let these emotions win over what we know about God. Look at me real quick. I think in my heart, look at this. I'm convinced most people fight emotions more than they fight the devil. I'm, I'm convinced of that. People fight how they feel more than they fight the devil. Now, the devil could be, could be inciting some of these things. I don't know. But I'm convinced so many people don't enjoy their Christian life because they think God feels about them how they feel about them. Right? I think a lot of people go through these emotions in life and, and they're working through fear and anxiety and that's the struggle they were dealing with. There's a scripture in 1 John that says, when our heart condemns us not, we have confidence toward God. That, that's a verse talking about when we feel guilty and we mess up. The next verse says in the New Living Translation, but God is greater than our feelings our feelings the disciples through all this crazy weekend of the crucifixion and they had forgotten that Jesus said I'm going to come back it's easy to forget what God says when emotions are running really high but the Bible says the just shall live by faith my challenge for you today is I don't know what's happening. I don't know what emotion is running you right now. I don't know what fear has gripped your heart. But I want to tell you today, have faith. Because he can walk right in the middle. He can hold you in the middle of the storm. And he can settle your heart and show you who he is and give you strength and peace. But if you could just sit there and not let yourself be run by an interior dialogue that is saying that you're a failure and you suck. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said that. It's Sunday morning. 9 a.m. don't, 11 doesn't care, but it's 9 a.m. okay. All right. That's real life. Man ran off some families. Lenita locked the doors. The man ran off some families. That's okay. That's the real stuff, though. Some of you thought worse coming to church today than I just said just now. Let's just be honest. Let's be real. It could always be worse. <laughs> but hear me today. Sometimes we are our greatest enemy. And I want to pray for the people who are wrestling within because you got to think the victory's already won. Jesus is raised from the dead. He's on his way. But they don't know it. And they're, and they're gripped by how they feel. And no doubt, Jesus walks in. I don't know how he came in. But that's how I would have came in. But like... <laughs> Just to remind you, it doesn't matter how you feel. God is greater than how you feel. Amen, everybody. <laughs> Father, I pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl who are struggling with how they feel. Gripped by emotions. Gripped by fear. 
gripped by anxiety. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, show up in the middle. Give them the peace they need. Give them that word that they need. Say what they need to hear right now to stabilize them in the middle of struggle and fight. Father, I pray that you show yourself strong to them that feel weak. God, I pray that you show them the nail prints and show them the cut marks and show them that you've been human and show them your strength and show them your, your presence. In Jesus' name, in this church said, amen, 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 amen. Come on all over the room if you're comfortable. Let's raise our hands to heaven. He's in the middle of the situation. He's in the middle of the situation. I pray against the spirit of suicide. There's somebody in this room that you have been contemplating it and you're just like, you know what? Life is not worth living. Can I tell you that's a lie from the enemy. God from the foundations of the earth knew you and loved you and died for you. Though you don't feel no value in yourself, God thought you were to die for. Pray those dark clouds away of anxiety and depression today in Jesus' name. I pray new life come in Jesus' name. We speak against the spirit of fear. God did not give that to you. Walk in confidence today in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing it together all over this house. And in the middle of my fear, come on, come declare on. with You're your heart today. that won't relent. Sing it out. And in the middle of my suffering. You're the strength I need to stand hey. And in the middle of the chaos You're the peace that makes no sense hey. Cause you're the God of the middle You're the God of the middle And in the middle of the garden Your will is signed for His Before the joy set before you You adore to the end Come on. And in the middle of the Jesus and you're just not sure you're on your way to heaven maybe you've drifted from God or maybe you've what we would call uh, you need a restart you need to rededicate your life maybe you were following Jesus as a child and this season of your life you hear him calling your name he stepped right in the middle of this room just now and you feel him drawing you at this section of the service can I tell you today be the best decision you ever made in your life to surrender your life once and for all once and for all so if that's you, I want you to make this moment, I want you to include yourself right now. And I want you to know that he loves you. He died for you. He wants a relationship with you. He's got a purpose for you. And he's got a home in heaven for you. And let's all pray this prayer together. Say, dear God, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean with your blood. Thank you for showing up in the middle. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, and this church said, amen. Come on, give God a big praise all over the house. At this time, our prayer team's coming. They're gonna join me across the front. If you need prayer for anything in your family, your mind, your children, whatever it may be, we would love to pray with you after the service. You can make your way down. Give us the opportunity to be a part of that with you. And you can give on your way out. We thank God for your generosity to help us reach as many people for Christ 
as we can. Father, we thank you for this great day in your house. We bless your name, and we know that you show up right in the middle, and we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor, and this church said, amen, amen. God bless your church, and we will see you soon.